Hey, good morning, Lifeway Church. Hey, everybody, welcome. Just invite you to stand and join us in singing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you're so good. You're so worthy. We exalt your name this morning.
I'm moving forward to follow after you. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. You're ready.
never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will see Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see how the good trouble. And I just want to read another verse, Psalms 27. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that your goodness doesn't depend on the stuff, God. It 
doesn't depend on our circumstances. It doesn't depend, God, on how we feel. Your goodness was yesterday, today, and forever. God, would we experience your goodness in the land of the living today? Through trials, through troubles, through circumstances, God, you are good. You are a good, good father, and you love your children. Amen. Yeah. I just want to welcome you to Lifeway Church. It's so good for you to be here. For all of those who are new, welcome. My name is Brittany Patches. If you don't know me, I'm married to Aaron Patches, and we do youth ministry together. Um, and we just want to welcome you to our services here and online. And um, our vision here at Lifeway Church is for you to know Christ, discover your purpose, and impact lives for eternity. If you just want to turn your attention, there will be some video announcements. Thank you. You can have a seat. Good morning and welcome to Lifeway Church. If this is your first time, we're so happy you're with us today. As you came in, you were handed a worship guide. It'll tell you a little bit about us and ways you can connect with Lifeway Church. Speaking of connection, we have a connect card in the seat backs in front of you or at our connection kiosks. Please fill one out and bring it to the Welcome Center out in the lobby. We would love to bless you with a Lifeway mug and some goodies to sweeten your day. At Lifeway Church, we believe that God answers prayer. We offer prayer and praise cards where you can request prayer or tell us how God has moved in your life. Connect cards, prayer and praise cards, and offering envelopes can be found in the seat backs in front of you or at our connection kiosks. These are located by both exits of our auditorium as well as the lobby entrance. Interested in giving a donation to Lifeway? We have a number of options for you. Cash and check donations can go in an offering envelope Please make checks payable to Lifeway Church. Digital giving can happen one of three ways. There is the Give Online button found on our website, lifewaychurch.life. You can also text to give by saving us in your cell phone contacts as 84321. Text any amount to that number and our automated system will reply with steps to help you get set up. The third way is by downloading the Church Center app. Once you pick Lifeway as your church and get signed in, it allows you to give, sign up for a group, pre-check your kids into the children's ministry, and register for church events like a Discovery Pathway class. Lastly, if you've brought your child into the main service with you today, be very sensitive to those around you. Please attend to your child quickly by exiting the auditorium if they begin to make noise. The voice of your child will be heard on the recording of today's sermon, so please help us make this service enjoyable for those listening around you and online. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your morning.
right, good morning. Welcome to Lifeway. We're so glad to have you. I know we have some, uh, a lot of new faces here this morning. I just want to say we love guests. We love having you uh, here this morning. And um, you probably came to the most controversial message I'll teach all year, so way to go. Good job. If you're trying to, if you're trying to suss out Lifeway, this is a good day to come, uh, for better or for worse. So, hey, I don't know how many of you have been, how many have been touched by someone who's struggling with, like, sickness during this season? We had, like, eight people call off a church today, for, or, or ten people for working today. So uh, a lot of the cold flu type stuff is taking a lot of people out. Can we just take a moment and pray? You know, in the Bible, uh, there was a, a, a time when a plague was upon Israel, and, and Aaron, Moses told Aaron, go take a censer, go stand between the plagues. So we can just intercede and ask God to make it stop. Let's do that. Father, we just uh, agree together in Jesus' name for your, your grace upon us. Father, we're asking thus far no more. Would you, would you heal those whose bodies are afflicted in Jesus' name with various uh, you know, communicable diseases? Uh, those who have been carrying things in their uh, chronic diseases in their body, they've been asking for help for a long time. We pray for your grace upon them today to heal, to restore, and to strengthen them to go through what they're facing in Jesus' name. And as we get into the word again today, Father, I pray that, that we would have a humility to receive with meekness your word and to have the heart that wants to please you, period, in all that we do, to be well-pleasing to you on the day that we stand before you. And so I ask you to anoint me to, to teach again uh, what was taught at the first service, and I pray that you anoint their hearts to receive it with meekness and that we grow together in the grace of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, we are in a series called It Is Written. And, and it is written, we've been looking at how to study the scriptures. I'm not joking when I say you came to the most, probably the most controversial message I will talk about this year. Um, it's called debatable things. And our first message we looked at is the Bible, the word of God. How can I trust the Bible? That kind of stuff. So I really want to encourage you, don't, don't take this one message out of the context of the rest of it. Or you will, you'll, you'll, you know, inevitably you'll just draw some wrong conclusions. The second message was on how to study the Bible. The third and fourth message were on how to apply it. And today we're going to look at when we study it and when we go to apply it, what happens when we run into debatable things, things that Christians have disagreed about. Three and a half years ago, I taught this message when we were over at the Regal Cinemas. And uh, the week before I was going in, I was hanging out with a Mennonite pastor friend of mine. I don't Believe it or not, I was a Mennonite pastor at one time. Can you believe that? I was a former Marine, was a Mennonite pastor. Let the reader understand. That is, a, that is crazy. But anyway... This is one of the friends I made during that time. And so, uh, well, we were hanging out talking. He asked, what are you talking about this weekend? I said, I'm going to be talking about debatable things. Well, like, like what? And so I gave him a list of things. But when I got to the one on non-resistance versus just war, and he goes, oh, that's being like pacifism. We don't do that. And kid Christians serve in the military. He looked at me and goes, oh, you think that's debatable? And I said, I do. And then I said, I said, take Romans 13, for example, how it says uh, that, that uh, we're to submit to the governing authorities and, and God has anointed them for their task and they are ministers unto that end and they don't bear the sword in vain. I said, bro, swords are not for shaving or chopping onions, they're for killing people. I mean, maybe you go get sued, but you know what I'm saying. He looked at me and was like, and he said, you know that's debatable, right? And I said, exactly. <laughs> I said, it's not that I can't see the other position. I most certainly can. It's that they can't see the other position themselves. Or we see it and we ignore it. And all of us at some point face those things. And in fact, Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans chapter 14 addresses this very thing. I'm going to read the whole chapter. We don't normally read a whole chapter in one shot here in life. But I think the whole thing is important. We're going to read it to you. As I read it, I want you to consider yourself. I want you to think about the things that you hang on to that are super important to you, that when somebody else begins to disagree, they call themselves a Christian. In your mind, you're thinking, of course, they're not really one. They call themselves a Christian. How can they be a Christian and do fill in the blank? And there may be people who are calling themselves a Christian and they're doing things that God clearly calls sinful. But what about the times when God doesn't clearly call it sinful? Or worse yet, you see a couple different things in the Bible and it's trying to figure it out. What do we do then? So with that in mind, let's look at Romans 14. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything. 
But another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Sorry, vegans. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another, and another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And he who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives uh, thanks to God. And he who abstains does, does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Let me say that again. We will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him, it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification, or building other people up. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it's wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you do, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Heavy duty, right? All right, we're done. I'm just kidding. Like, what do we do with that? So the Apostle Paul opens up with kind of a thought-provoking, idea-provoking intro to this is that Christians don't agree on everything. How many ever figured that out in your experience? <laughs> yeah, when I was a new believer in the Lord and, and, and the people that were mentoring me, they would begin to teach me and I would accept face value. Yeah, this is the way it is or, or this is the way it is. And, and then and I meet another Christian who had a whole different perspective. In fact, sometimes almost the opposite, who seemed to love Jesus just as much as the other person. And, and they would say stuff. And man, before long, I was confused. Have you ever been there? And there was a call then at some point in my heart, I began to realize if I need at some point to do exactly what the apostle said. At some point, I need to learn to live before the Lord ultimately. I mean, I'm going to have to search the scriptures and figure out with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, what is true and how am I going to live my life? So he opens up, there are things that Christians, uh, they don't agree about. And and while there are clear things that God addresses clearly in the scriptures, the death of Jesus Christ, his deity, his resurrection from the dead, salvation through faith in him, I think those things are crystal clear. There are things that are about as clear as mud on other things. Uh-uh. You remember last week I shared, with Sharon, I said, uh, when I became a Christian, people literally would tell me, the first people that mentored me said, just read the Bible and do what it says. That is literally impossible. <laughs> Proverbs says, uh, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 7 later, it's good for a man not to marry. Which is it? The Old Testament, you have, uh, you have God telling the Israelites uh, to go into the land, dispossess their enemies, utterly kill, destroy them, show them no mercy. Jesus shows up later, Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You follow me. You can't just read the Bible and do it. What we really mean is read the Bible, interpret it, wrestle with it, see how it applies to your life, and then as you apply it, in honor towards God, live it out. Isn't that what we really mean? So last week, you would hear that message, that was controversial too, but we, had, we, we dealt with all the big white elephants in the room. But you know, there are a lot more of those things in the Bible. 
And the question we got to ask ourselves is how we're going to live towards the Lord. You know, Paul brought up things like Sabbaths and foods that you could eat and food sacrifice to idols and things like that. But, but the list of what the church has debated throughout church history has been extensive. But let me just give you like 14 things. This is a short list. It's actually longer, but what day of the week to worship on? Do we worship at Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown? Well, there are certain groups of people who would say absolutely. Other Christians insist, it's Sunday, brother. You're breaking the Sabbath. Other people say, Jesus is my Sabbath rest. It doesn't matter what day, which is why Paul, of course, had to address it here. Eating meat or living vegan. Can Christians drink wine or not? Non-resistance and just war. How about the role of women in ministry? Can women teach men? The sovereignty of God versus the free choice of man. When we talk about something like that, it's classically uh, pitted as Calvinism versus Arminianism or these kind of things. And did God elect people to be saved? Did they, they have no choice or, or do they have a choice? And how does that work? That, that's a, this stuff this gets serious when you're in it. Can you lose your salvation or not? Some of you are already mad. I didn't even say anything. You're remembering the argument you had. I haven't even argued for a position yet. <laughs> You should feel the tension in the room. It's ridiculous. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, can I just open that baptismal up? And anyway, <laughs> oh, you really want to go somewhere? How about end time events? Premillennial, postmillennial, millennial? pre wrath rapture, pre trib rapture, uh, uh, no rapture. Oh, God forbid you say that. You know, <laughs> music style and worship. We should just sing hymns. The theology was better. I, I would happily debate that with somebody. Let's, let's pull out some of those hymns and look at some of the theology. You mean the ones you sing the most have good theology, but not all of them. Church government. And I like, by the way, hymns. We do them here sometimes too, but I'm just saying. Church government. Bishop-led, elder-led, congregational-led. We had a guy leave the church because he found out we're an elder-led government and the congregation doesn't vote on specific matters. I'm done. Because the Bible says, you know, and I said, well, man, if you show me that Bible verse, I'll repent. It's not there. Uh, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> As of late, c tattoos, what does God think about that? Appropriate forms of birth control. Or can you use birth control at all? These have been real debates throughout church history. They have split churches, man. Split people, separated friends, cause people to run the other way. Public school versus homeschool versus whatever other kind of school you can think of. Man, when I was in my early 20s, it was homeschool all the way. And if you did anything else, I was pretty sure you were serving the devil with your children. <laughs> Lydia's, my wife's classic statement was, I am not raising children for the devil. I'm like, whoa, she would be you know, home. And she, we didn't, but we began to realize that there are people who love their kids just as much as we do, who are seeking the Lord, trying to figure out what to do. And before it was all over with, we ended up homeschooling, private schooling, cyber schooling, and then a last little stint, some, some public school and... And we try different things. And then, of course, human sexuality. What's appropriate? Can two women who love each other get married? Does God permit it now? Ooh, I wish you could feel the tension right now. <laughs> You're going to go there, Pastor Jimmy? Oh, I, absolutely. The rest of the world's going there. Why wouldn't I go there? Why wouldn't we talk about it? Because you think about these things, and the only people that are educating you are those you're getting through social media and those who got the loudest mouth. Well, I got a big mouth, so I'm going to let mine rip too. <laughs> Before I do that, <laughs> most people in the instances I just listed to you, regardless of what side of the argument they're on, most of them, and not all of them, because some people are trying to live for their own desires. I'm talking those who've come to the scriptures, they are wrestling with it, they're seeking God, they are trying to understand. Most people are goodwill people who want, that are Christian, that are following Jesus, who surrendered life to Jesus, want to know the truth and want to please God. So here's the question. How do two people who want to know the truth and want to please God get so divided on different points in the scripture? You've already been there. Most of you, have, if you've lived, I'm 50, so if you've lived at least that long, I promise you, you've, you're not trying hard enough if you're not bumping into an argument somewhere. <laughs> you know, it just seems to, they seem to find me. So I don't know why. Well, why do two people who love God and disagree on things sometimes very intensely disagree and both say they're basing it on the Bible. What are we supposed to do when we find ourselves in that place at odds with another brother or sister in Christ? How should we live and act toward one another? You know, Paul the Apostle 
uh, foreseeing it, writing first, uh, Romans 14, and also here in, in 1 Corinthians 13, he writes this. He says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will eventually cease. Tongues being supernatural languages inspired by the Holy Spirit or the learning of language by the Holy Spirit, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. I don't even know, how, how does knowledge pass away? I mean, that's going to be an amazing thing. Like, there's no more knowledge. There's just Jesus. Some of you are like, yeah, mind blown. For we know in part, listen to this statement, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when, that, when, perfect, when the perfect comes, I'm assuming this is referring to the second coming of Christ, the partial will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. I want you to say this with me. Say, I know in part. For some of you, that was very hard to say. Because when I'm debating one side of an argument, I am sure I know fully. Buddy, how come you don't get what I get? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever been arguing for something and can't see why are they so blind? <laughs> Nick's waving his hand about polit more political discussions, but yes, you know. <laughs> we know in part, period. And on this side of eternity, even the most prophetic person knows in part. If I could sit Paul the Apostle, who wrote all this right here, I would be justified if we were debating something, looking at him and going, yep, I appreciate your visions. You're caught up into heaven. You're a really neat guy. And I, I've read all your stuff. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm a real fan. I'm a follower, okay? But, but even he knows in part. There's only one that knows fully. So when we approach a topic like debatable things, maybe one of the most important things we need to do is just lay a hold of a little bit of humility as we square off with one another to open our ears to hear one another. If someone's got bad fruit in their life, you don't see, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking to somebody you see good fruit in their life. I'm not a real fan of tattoos. I have one from my time in the Marine Corps, but I would have considered that something I did when I was lost. Then I meet these, I was meeting these millennial Christians that were getting them as Christians. And I was like, what? And I had this one guy, his name's Corey Martin. And Corey is a guy who walks with the Lord. He is on fire. That guy's led so many people to Christ and his love and devotion to Jesus and the fruit in his life are without question in my life. So when he wanted to get this big tattoo across his chest of like, I don't know, it had something to do with God and Holy Spirit, whatever, I looked at him like, are you kidding me? And I, I fought so hard to talk him out of that. And, and, and but part of the deal was, is I began to square off with a guy who had, he had humility, he was willing to hear me. The question wasn't whether or not he was willing to hear me as the older mentor, it was whether or not I was willing to hear him. I'm not going to answer what happened in that discussion, but I don't think that's the most important part. The important part is having humility before God and our fellow believer in Jesus Christ. And here's the deal. Many debatable things happen around things that we know partially. Does that make sense? And so the bottom line in this series is while God's calling us to a serious pursuit of being solid, anchored in the word of God, living my life before Jesus, living my life to please God, we have to accept that there are times that we're going to encounter debatable things. And when we do, what will we do? And so uh, with that in mind, I got three questions and we're going to look at this morning. How do I determine if something is debatable or if God's spoken clearly on a particular topic? Two. How do I relate to others who disagree with me on debatable things? And three, how do I relate to God in debatable things? So let's start with question number one. How can we determine if something is actually debatable in God's word? So, so let's be clear. First, if the Bible presents a consistent stand on a topic, that topic is not debatable. That means if I go to the Old Testament, the New Testament, and every instance stays consistent, it's not debatable. Which leads to my next one. If the Bible presents a consistent stand on the topic, but ABC News disagrees on that topic, that topic is not debatable. What am I getting at? Because some of you came knowing this, this message was coming today. Your friends invited friends. I know my son was texting people like, come on, dude, you got to hear this. I'm like, Micah, not the best message to introduce your friend. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but, but, here, but here's the thing. Well, you are facing culturally debatable things, but that's not what this is about. Because honestly, I don't care what the culture thinks about anything. As a Christian, I care about them as human beings. 
I care about their need if they present. I care about that. But I mean, if they come judging the way I live or think I'm a little too conservative or a little too prude on things or I should try this or try that, I'm like, I'm not real concerned about what they think. Because Paul said we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of not ABC News, right? But the judgment seat of Christ. You know, when Jesus, we looked at this in the opening of the, the series, Jesus squares off with the devil. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, could have appealed to his own inherent authority. But when the devil was tempting him and said, hey, if you're, you've been fasting 40 days, and if you're the son of God, turn this stone into bread. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes or proceeds through the mouth of God. Jesus appealed to the authority of the word of God. So the devil ups the ante and begins to quote scripture. But notice what the devil didn't do. What we do today, oh, that's not God's word. I don't need to honor that. The devil didn't even try that, yet we try that today. Think about that. And the reason I don't care, and just because the culture debates it, it doesn't make it debatable for us. Here's why. ABC News is not the authority. God is. Jimmy Diamond up here preaching to you is not the authority. Jesus is. You can't live your life for what I think, what your mom and dad think, what the world thinks. Because all of us will stand before the judgment seat of the one who died for us and rose again and answer to him for how we lived our lives. Answer to him for the things we believed, the things we did. But here's how, you, here's how you establish what's truly debatable. Because we're not looking for culturally debatable. I'm wondering what is biblically debatable. The things Christians have argued about. Not what Christians in the world are arguing about, but what Christian and Christian, follower of Christ and follower of Christ, are arguing about. And here's how you do it. If the Bible seemingly presents two or more ideas on a topic, then that is debatable. You know, there's a really important verse that comes out of Psalm 119. And Psalm 119, while it is a song, it's a song that carries a lot of powerful theology in it as it relates to the Bible and the Scriptures. And in Psalm 119, verse 160, it says this in the New King James Version. The entirety of your word is truth. The Message Bible says it this way. Your words all add up to the sum total truth. What's he getting at here? Well, probably most of the errors that have happened in church history happened because people emphasized one particular doctrine, one particular idea over other ideas. And instead of taking, the, taking a whole picture at it and trying to learn and ask God, God, how do we do this? Because the early church had to wrestle with that. If you go to Acts 15 and then Acts chapter 20, they were wrestling whether or not non-Jews could, could even be saved to become Christians and, and follow Jesus Christ. And they had to wrestle this out because they had verses that seemed to indicate they couldn't. And then they had prophecies that they were pulling out that James brings up in Acts 15 that seemed to indicate they could. And so they had to wrestle it out. Folks, it's no different today. We have to go through the same arduous but holy process to do that. Are you following me? So if the entirety of God's word is essential to understanding a part of God's word, did you hear what I said? If the entirety of God's word is essential to understanding a part of God's word, then considering what the Bible says in different places about the same topic is important. And honestly, this was something I failed at to a certain extent in my walk with the Lord. So let me give you some examples. I'm going to pick two real hot button items right up front just to have fun. I love you. I hope you'll love me when it's all over. I want to say this. I feel, I have a, I have a, the, the stuff that I've wrestled with, I've wrestled with in the light of standing before Jesus Christ, wanting to know, I just want to hear one thing when it's all over with, well done, good and faithful servant, first thing. Second thing, the Bible says that teachers hold a stricter judgment. I take that quite seriously, okay? But now here's the deal. Some of you are called to the Word. Some of you are theologians. Some of you are teachers. And you may disagree with me. So I'm presenting that to understand the more important thing is this part of it. And if it were all concrete and clear, seriously, 
Couldn't Paul the apostle, was Romans 14 necessary? If Paul just listed all the debatable things, let's talk about Sabbaths, let's talk about food, let's talk about all that list of stuff I said, and he could have put it there and just given it, put something there and just given us a bullet point of, here's how you do this, 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 forever and for all time, it is settled, now do it that way. The end, the apostle Paul sealed, Poof. and the church for all history would have obeyed. So the question is, if God could have made it clear but didn't make it clear, the question we need to ask is why? I believe, you, you, I said the other week, if God is almighty, couldn't, be, uh, couldn't he be all clear? I believe he can. So when an almighty God is not all clear, I think there's all purpose in it. And that purpose is that we would, I think God's much more interested in us nailing our theology is nailing our nature. Learning to submit and grow in the nature of God and Jesus Christ to become holy even as he is holy. In our love, in our truth, in our, in our uh, 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 observing and giving, and just that whole nature of what he's developing in maturity, that the depth of Jesus Christ would get deep in us. And so as I say, talk about some of these next things, I want to say that one is biblically debatable, one is definitely not. Let's open up with the one that's biblically debatable, women in ministry. Women in ministry. I was raised in a, in a non-Christian home. When I was raised in this non-Christian home, I watched my parents divorce, my dad... Uh, married a lady who was uh, phenomenally smart, as a double PhD. She mostly, she mostly led the home, really, after dad. Previously, my dad was married to my mom. My dad mostly led the home because my mom, they had kind of traditional roles there. So I got to see traditional roles and non-traditional roles worked out in the home. Now, to be clear, at that season of my life, I didn't like my stepmother. So where my next step led me is very, was very easy. I began, became a Christian, and again, people told me to read the Bible, so I started reading the Bible, and I'm, I'm finally making my way into 1 Timothy for the first time, and I come upon a place where it says, Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach, nor have authority over a man. And for me, I read it, and that forever settled it. The problem was, I wasn't doing the sum of your word is truth, I was just doing that word is truth. And then as time went on, I began to measure every other verse of scripture I would run into, through that verse, for example, Paul the Apostle says to the church at, at Corinth, he says, hey, I, uh, women should keep silent in the churches. And like a couple chapters later, he gives instructions on how women can prophesy in the church. How do you do that? How do you keep silent and then also speak? Uh, I had a quandary here. I recognized, we talked about in the uh, interpretation and the application thing. I had, I, there's clearly some contextual things that I'm missing to understand fully what's going on, but what I'm sure of is you can't be quiet and be talking at the same time. And so this took me, this took me on a journey. Now, uh, in that season, I began to, I was fine. I didn't care. I, I would go to churches. Some churches were fine with women teaching and doing that. Some weren't. You know, in the Mennonite church, obviously, we didn't do that much. So in, in time, I just didn't care because ultimately these leaders were responsible for what they were doing. But now I'm going to plant Lifeway Church. Friends, I went into a two-year season of searching the scriptures to try to understand this. And again, it came out about as clear as mud for me. And one of the internal challenges I had to face, because I mostly, have mercy on me, but this is where I was at. I, I mostly didn't let women do much in the ministries that I led previously because I looked at that verse and was mostly kind of afraid of that verse. Because again, remember, I'm a guy that's going to stand before Jesus. But then when I began to see Philip had four virgin daughters, four unmarried daughters who prophesied to the apostle Paul, that began my challenge. When I saw a lady named Priscilla and her husband Aquila, and she's mentioned first, which is strange, unusual in that day, taught a man named Apollos, another, I think, an apostolic leader. He appears to be an apostle because he's planting churches. Another apostle, the way of God more perfectly. So here's Priscilla helping her husband teach the Apollos the way of God more perfectly. Now, here's what I want to say about all that. What happens when we study the scriptures is things come to mind. If you lean to more conservative, you've got excuses for me as you've developed constructs in your mind about why that doesn't mean quite what it says. And I know that because I have all those constructs for every other thing I don't believe. I'm just saying. And we have to do that. You can't escape that because you have to build, you have to fill in the gaps with things you don't know. Do you realize every movie that you watch, you're filling in gaps with your mind whether you know it or not. And they know that when they write that. It's like God made us to do that. And so when I began to see this thing with women, here's ultimately where I landed was, it's not clear. I see women even in the New Testament. Junia is a, called a, a deaconess or a diaconi, the same word for deacon. 
I began to look and as I searched the scriptures and I began to see, uh, I, I, I'm savvy with original languages. So I, I began to look at uh, uh, Paul's statement to Timothy about elders. And it said, it talked about elders in the word, uh, is the word presbyteros. And, he, and I look at this word and I'm like, okay, that word here means elder. And then I go over to Titus chapter three, where it says, let the older women teach the younger women. And that word is also presbyteros, but instead of calling them elders, it called them uh, 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 older women. <laughs> Why do we call them older men and the other one? And, and, I, and, we, and so human beings, we have a tendency to bring our confirmation bias to everything that we're facing. We don't mean to, we can't help it. It's kind of hardwired into us. And so it takes diligence to resist your own confirmation bias. So I began to go, okay. Finally, the past, I began to talk to some of, my, some of my elders going, it sure looks like that should probably be translated either elder or female elder or male elders or something like that, like between the two. Well, finally, the Passion Translation came out and did actually call that section female elders. What's my point in all this? I began to realize that, okay, I'm going to stand before Jesus. I'm going to account. And I began to realize if, if I have to account for which way I'm going to land and the Bible seems to not be as clear on it as I'd like it to be, then I'm going to opt for the side that errs on the side of liberty, not on the side of confinement. That's where I landed. Because I realized, I had to ask myself, what can you as the leader of Lifeway Church stand before Jesus Christ with on the day of the Lord? That's the one I can stand with. Now, we still believe, I'll just be clear here for those who want to know, we have, maybe the senior leader should still be a, a male leader because we believe in the home, uh, uh, that the home, according to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 22 to 33, should be led by a husband. But even then, it says, um, submit to one another in the fear of God. And then it tells wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord and everything. Then husbands, lay your life down, like die. It's gotta be the most brilliant passage ever written because on one hand, he gives guys the authority and then says, now use it to serve. And so it doesn't negate that there's a final answer, but the actual walking out, I don't know how your marriages work, but in mine, there's a lot of discussion about making decisions. How many of you ever met my wife? She's a little bit strong, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Strong and submitted, but she's strong, and you know. <laughs> and so that's where we're that's where we're at at this church. Now you may at least say, I, I disagree with you. I'm okay with that because it's a debatable thing. Let me tell you what's definitely not hanging on this. Anyone's salvation. But but here's the thing I've learned in debatable things. When I hold to a debatable position and I it feels like it is, right? Man, if you don't get your end time theology right, you might not be saved. I know a guy who told me that. I know a guy who told me because of my disagreement with his understanding of the sovereignty of God, he told me I was a heretic. And I'm like, so you know God that well, do you? Now let's talk about this. I think that's biblically debatable. Some of you are gonna disagree with me because that's, that's the way you roll. Uh, and I get it. Let's talk about homosexuality. I believe the Bible from cover to cover is ostensibly against same-sex relationships. I don't, think you, I don't think you could find it. I've tried to look 50 ways from Sunday to give the other argument a chance. It's not there. You are reaching. You're making stuff up. It's not there. In fact, we did a message. We did a series called What Does the Bible Say? I think it was last year or two years ago. And in there, I did a message called Such Were Some of You. And we, we have a very compassionate communication about homosexuality, its error, and how to, how to love people who are in that place. Now, here's the thing. When I say that, the reality is some of you who are same-sex attracted or you walk in same-sex relationships, you look at that and see, see, you people elevate one sin above another. We really don't. I was a heterosexual, immoral person when Jesus Christ found me. I, I don't even know how many sexual partners I have had before I came to Christ. It's a high number. When that Baptist preacher got in my face and put his finger in me, and back then they put their finger in your face. They didn't just talk to you, you know what I'm saying? And said, that's sin. And, then, you know, pff, and I'm on the, you know, and it's like, I think he's pointing at me. I didn't say, you know, man, having a lot of women in my life, that's like, that's my, uh, that's just my nature, man. I was just like, I'm, I'm made this way. I didn't say that. I said, you're right, I need to repent. How about a thief, right? What if a thief came and they steal? I've known kleptomaniacs and they come and they steal and they came and said something along the lines of, man, I just can't help myself. I just got to steal. It's in my nature. You know what I'd say to that? You're absolutely right. 
But Jesus died. He came, he died, and he was resurrected and sent his Holy Spirit to give you a new nature. You don't have to be enslaved to your nature. Whatever it was. Same sex, heterosex, immorality, stealing. The Bible talks about drunkenness and being given over to to addictive behaviors. And it says none of that stuff's going to inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus died to make sure you can. If you'll believe in him, receive his spirit, he can change your inclinations to be no longer inclined to give in to sin, but to resist it in honor of him. See, here's the thing. Being born again, Jesus made this statement about being born again. Being born again is about being born again. You don't hang on to the old life. You become something new. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with what you said about women. I don't agree about this. I, I think it's okay to be gay and be a Christian. Awesome. Let's talk about this then. How should we relate to others who disagree with us on debatable things? Are you ready? Love. Period. By love. Let's talk about what I mean by that. Back in uh, uh, a few years ago, we had, the, of course, the uh, uh, shooting at the nightclub in Orlando. It was largely a gay nightclub. I'm sure, I'm sure you know, uh, heterosexuals went in there too, but it was largely a gay nightclub. The shooter went in there with intent to do serious harm uh, to, to all the gays in that place, right? How many have heard of Westboro Baptist Church? Westboro Baptist Church has made the news many times. They, they, and the reason I, 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 you know, I try not to despise them, but it's hard not to because in them, there is a, this idea that we're right and everybody else is wrong. And so then they'll show up with these signs and picket and say, God hates fags and, and all this stuff. And um, they'll show up at military funerals where guys have been in combat because they don't like it. And so they're, they're going to picket that. And, and they've got an opinion on everything. And of course, they make the news and, and they've got this, it's the way they approach it. Here's the deal. What, what are they saying? We disagree with your lifestyle. Okay, I have no problem with you speaking out. I'm doing it right now. But I'm doing so respectfully. Do you follow me? So I know if some people say, if I say Westboro Baptist Church is wrong, they say, well, how are you not like Westboro Baptist? You, you don't understand uh, 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 my thing. And if you disagree with me, then you don't love me. That's kind of a common thinking today. Folks, that's, can I just, that's just dumb. Don't you have friends who disagree with you but know they love you? Right? Disagreement isn't what makes love, love. I can disagree with someone I love. I can disagree intently heatedly with someone I love. Uh, spouses, anybody here? <laughs> I love my spouse. Sometimes we disagree and the lightsabers come out. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and I'm always on the good side of the force and Lydia's on the, anyway. <laughs> she would disagree. That's a debatable thing. <laughs> um, I'm of the opinion that disagreeing with you is not what shows whether or not I love you, but respecting you, hearing you out, processing it, still disagreeing with you, not wishing hate on you. I wish you, were, I'm still in my mind thinking you need to repent and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. If you think because I think a person who walks in open defiant sin against Jesus is going to hell and perishing in a lake of fire forever, if you think that's mean and evil, I think the most loving thing I could do is to call you to repent so you don't go there. But to ignore your friend's plight and to let them go there with no care, that's a problem. Who, who does, who's not showing love now? Loving you is respecting your humanity even when we disagree. So here's what Paul says in this passage in Romans 14. Don't despise those with less faith. Don't judge those with more faith. And here's why you don't need to judge anybody, why you can leave it to God to do it, because we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So what I hear as a pastor when somebody says to me, I'm challenging them on sin in their life, and they say, you're judging me. You can't judge me. But the, what I hear them saying is, no one can judge me. I'm wrong, friend. Jesus Christ will judge you. But he knows my heart. You're not wrong. He does. He sees through all the lies, all the constructs, all the things you put up to do what you want to do so you can go headlong into sin. He is not confused. He sees it all. And that's why I could let, let Jesus handle judgment. Let me tell you about an interesting uh, season in my own life. We've raised five children. My daughter, Jessica, who's my oldest child, turned 16. Uh, she ultimately started 
uh, dating the guy that she would marry. And uh, as she became friends with his sisters, they were going to the beach one trip, and she came to me saying, Dad, because she's a good pastor's kid whose dad told her she could only wear one-piece bathing suits, came and appealed, Dad, I want to wear a bikini because all these other people, I feel like I stand out like a sore thumb. And I'm like, yeah, not only no, but hot place no. You know what I'm saying? That is not going to happen. And so on it goes. So she says, but Dad, what does modesty really mean? Isn't this talking really about a jewelry and stuff and putting yourself above others? And, and on the debate goes, you know, and we're in it. We're in a debatable thing. Now, listen, if you're on the side where I'm at, of course, you don't think it's debatable. Neither did I, right? But the fact is we're having a debate and the Bible has not said thou shalt not wear bikinis. That ha it doesn't even tell us how far clothing should go from neck to ankle. I don't even know for sure. I just know we're called to do something that doesn't provoke stumbling in people and we're called to do this kind of thing. So I'm trying to figure it out. So I went to the stumbling thing, Romans 14. I'm like, well, I don't want you to go to the beach and like cause these guys to, to stumble. That every, like, like, do you think I'm going to be the most attractive person on the beach? She's attractive in my opinion, but like, you know, I get what she's saying. Like, she's going to, of bikinis, I will have probably the most conservative one. You know, on it goes, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm in this place, and I'm looking at my daughter. Now, you got to understand, in our household, when our children turn 13 years old, we recognize them as adults. However you do it, I don't care, and that may be a debatable thing in your mind about when you do that. But we recognize them as adults. Now, they're young adults with limited privilege, but what can happen at 13 that couldn't happen before 13 is they can begin to challenge the things we've taught them respectfully. And so she comes and like, Dad, I respectfully challenge your position on this as an adult in this house, you know, and it served me my kind of writ of notice on that. <laughs> and so as we process that, I, I, I prayed, I was like, Lord, what should I do? And so I just said, hey, here, here's what I feel like you should do. Borrow one of their bikinis, go to the beach, pay attention to your conscience. Because the Bible says whatever, whatever you can't do from faith and a good conscience is Sin. So I don't care what is actually allowable. If your conscience bothers you, it's not for you. Did everybody get that message? Because that's right there in that Romans 14 passage, <laughs> and it's not debatable. So anyway, um, so I, I told her to do it. She went. She did it. Had a fun day at the beach. Came back. I couldn't wait for her to get back. I wanted to process with her. Jessica, let's talk. So what happened when you went? How were the guys looking at you? She said, no, I, don't, I didn't see anybody look at me. Oh, okay. How was your conscience? How did you feel? all but naked there on the beach, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> setting this up. And she's like, she's like, you know, my conscience did really, it didn't bother me at all. <laughs> Father fail. It didn't work, Lord, like I thought it would. <laughs> so I said, look, if your conscience doesn't bother you, that passage is clear. I'm not to judge you. Go ahead. I mean, you, you do what you're going to do, but please always stay sensitive to your conscience. Later that night, I was spending time with the Lord. I was in prayer. I had my Bible out. I was sitting there. I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, I want you to go down and talk to Jessica, and I want you to tell her and a or ask her, appeal to her not to wear a bikini. I, said, well, I just told her she could. <laughs> and you did. Did you talk to me about it? Anyway, so I was like, um, so I was like, uh, uh, I, I, so I, I went, and I, he said, because even though she has faith for it, you don't, and she's under your authority right now. When she's under Gavin's, they can work that out. That'll be a whole new deal. But right now, she's under your authority, and I'm going to hold you responsible for what you allow that you don't have faith for. Well, fear the Lord. So I, next morning I'm downstairs. She comes out for breakfast. We have a little conversation. I said, you remember, so, so can we talk? She's like, yeah. So I like, my daughter's like this tall, for those who know. I'm such a giant myself, as you can see. Um, <laughs> so I, I look at her and I'm like, so uh, the, you know, the whole bikini discussion, I, I feel like the Lord, I, I gotta ask you not to, to would, you, would you please, for, in our household, while you're still living here, before you marry again, will you please, honor us by not wear, by wearing a one piece because I don't have faith for it. She begins to cry. I mean, I'm not talking, like, like I'll, I'll get her tears and I'm thinking, oh, you are such a sorry dad. You gave it, you took it away. Bad dad. She says, no, no, she knows. She, she, she's, she's sharp. She's perceptive. She's looking at me like, she realizes, no, that's, uh, she says, no, that's not, you're, you're got this, you're, you're, I know what you're thinking. That's not what I'm thinking. She said, after you entrusted this to me, I began to feel the weight of my own responsibility before Jesus. You told me I'm going to stand before God. I began to think about this choice in the light of that day. And I said, God, if it's not your will, would you please send my dad to come back to me and tell me not to do it? Can I ask you a question? Can we trust Jesus to lead his church even though the process is messy? Folks, yeah. Jesus, but... Our pro we are humans. We are, we, we are destined for a messy process. 
I don't think the Lord's bothered by the messy process. He wants us to actually engage the process and get over our pride and egos to hear the Lord through one another. Now, now here's the, some of you say, I still like my bikinis. Listen, I don't judge you. you you're, that's before you and God. And I got to a place where I'm, I'm a little more relaxed on it because I began to go, you know, it's really about people's, like, like motives matter in everything. And what's funny is my daughter, Jessica, now has become so crazy conservative. She's like, my kids will never wear a bikini. And I'm like, whoa, what did I create? You know, like. <laughs> but the Lord, we, we, the bottom line is we need the Lord to lead us. And the reason I'm sharing, I'm trying to share with you. I, 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 yeah, I had the privilege of leading this church with the elders here. But man, I'm a, I'm a work in progress too. You, can, you understand? And I'm inviting you on a journey. Any church that creates the idea where you got to nail it. Oh, how dare you miss it? They create the, this kind of shame culture so you can't grow. How will you in fact grow? How can you even be real or authentic with the things you're struggling with if you're not allowed to fail? Now, he goes on to say, don't cause the, the people to stumble by what you approve. Now, I want to define stumbling in this context. The word is a Greek word, scand sc like scandal, like scandalize. This isn't about me offending you like we disagree, and so I don't like what you're doing. So listen, if we had to live, if that means that, no one can live. You will literally reduce things to the lowest common denominator, or the highest common denominator, I guess. I learned this, like I had this deal like, Christians should never drink wine. They shouldn't do whatever. Then I got in the Mennonite church. Bro, you've never seen so many different versions. In fact, I think there's like, like Baskin Robbins. There's 31 flavors. <laughs> and, and, and for one that dresses kind of like me, would still be conservative in their morals. I mean, now they're, now they're not as much. But, but, then, but then you have different versions all the way to, you know, horse and buggy Mennonites. Cars, black bumpers. And, and we can't figure out where along the thing. And so... The car that has no color judges the one that's got a little silver in their black chrome wheels. Well, you're sitting there, buddy. Silver chrome people are judging the ones that got color on their paint job, you know. And, and you see, I, I just began, it was in that season where I go, this is ridiculous. And I mean, I'll tell you what, I lived in Romans 14. Just see, God, I want to understand, how do we do this right? How do we do this? So he said, you're focused on not causing someone to stumble. And so I began to study around stumbling. The stumbling here is, Paul would have been talking about people who came out of idolatry. Who were, they would sacrifice meat and food to idols. It's carried in the context earlier in the book. And, and they see me having some filet mignon that was offered up to Zeus, okay? Now, as a Christian, I don't think an idol is anything. I think that's a dumb statue. It has no, I'm definitely eating this steak and not wasting it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but someone who believes that idol is something sees me eating that steak and knows it's got the Zeus-like grill stamp on it, the big Z, and they see me eating that, and they're going, whoa, that's like... He's worshiping Zeus and following Jesus. I will too. He's talking about not causing someone to fall away from Jesus Christ. If, if, if I feel comfortable drinking wine, but I'm aware that there's an alcoholic, you know, that's in my friendship circle, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Like, why would I do, I love my brother. I don't wanna set him up for stumbling. If I know, if I know, uh, you know, uh, I, I got friends who are, I really do got friends who are vegan and like actually eating meat really bothers them. I don't act like I'm a vegan. I just, they know I am, but I'm not going to like, you know, whatever, sacrifice my cow before them and watch them suffer while they, I was, hey, it's a vegetable dinner tonight for my friends, you know? Are you falling? So this idea of stumbling, we got to be very careful not to over apply it. And we've got to be careful to actually have an awareness that things we do, I don't care what anybody thinks. Well, you should. You should at least care enough about them to love them. So there's two points I want to pull out of this and then we'll get close to finishing here. Jesus is judge. You and I are not. First point. Second point is grant liberty to your brother or sister in Christ to live before the Lord, knowing that they will stand before Jesus and still call them to holiness. That means if you disagree with me, come set your case before me from your debatable passages, meaning you have the other portion of the verses I'm not looking at. I'm probably going to represent mine to you and say, how does that work in your mind? We discussed that. And if I don't land on the same conclusion as you, if your friend doesn't land on the same conclusion as you, can you give them liberty to live before Jesus like I tried to do with my daughter, trusting Jesus is big enough to work it out? Either he's a living God or he's no God. And the living God knows how to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment. So if somebody's off, he's good at his job. I dare you to say he's not. Third question is, how do I relate to God in debatable things? More specifically, if you're going to practice a debatable thing, like Jessica wants to wear a bikini or whatever, 
what are the questions, what are the guides posts that we can use to help guide us in that? I got four tests you can give something that's debatable. Test number one, does it glorify God or dishonor him? If it doesn't glorify God, by, 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 by dishonor, I mean, like, if, if I go out as a Christian, I think, oh, it's, I think it's okay for Christians to have wine. But then I go to a party where there's a bunch of worldly people, and they're crazy, and the cops show up, and I'm the Christian there, and I'm, I've got my little cup of whatever I'm having while everybody's... Like, folks, that's... You, you've dishonored... I think you've dishonored the Lord in your, in your witness, in your reputation... And the world doesn't see any difference. I know that because when I was a young Christian, I would go to the same parties my friends were, and I would live the same way. I'd repent to them later. But here's the bottom line. They saw no discernible difference between me and the world around them. Now, um, you know, while I, I always find it fascinating that I'll find Christians who are totally against, Christians should never drink anything, yet Jesus turned water into wine. Well, that wasn't wine. Prove it from the scripture. I can't. Okay, then. Well, debatable. Um, so, uh, so, so they'll have a problem with that, but then they don't have a problem with gluttony, which is also clearly condemned in the scripture. And yet we don't tell people to quit eating. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so there's, I can do this with a lot of different topics. I think the point I want to make is, is where am I living to glorify God in my witness and being asking the Holy Spirit? I, I check in with the Lord on, on all these kind of things. Second thing is, test two, it, does it help or hurt someone else? Paul the Apostle is clear in that Romans 14 passage, whatever we're doing, should not harm someone else. If it harms someone else, their, their faith in Jesus, their personal walk with the Lord, it's hurting them and we shouldn't do it. Test three, can I do it with faith and a good conscience? I want to spend just a second here and say this. Well, I gave the example with Jessica and, and, and myself. I find that there's a lot of people that don't put enough energy on letting their conscience speak to them. Romans chapter two talks about the Jews who have a law. Romans chapter 1, going into chapter 2, Paul's been talking about the Jewish law. And he says to, he's talking to the Jewish people at that moment, and he says to the Gentiles, that would be us, non-Jewish people. He said, the non-Jewish people, they don't have a law, yet they have this law in their conscience accusing them or excusing them. And listen, listen real close to this. God will use your conscience to judge you on the day of Jesus Christ. That's what he says. Here. He'll judge the secrets of your heart on that day. Now, what are the secrets of the heart? The secrets of the heart are those things where you looked at me and you said, or you looked at someone and said, I think God's okay with it. I'm okay to do this. And, and, you, and you knew it wasn't right, but you said it anyway. Lydia's, Lydia's brother, my wife's brother, Ralph, grew up in a Christian home. Somewhere in his journey, probably had something happen, but later he came out as gay to his family. When his dad asked him, son, you know, the Bible says this. He said, well, I sought the Lord and he said, and I believe the Lord told me it was okay. What's he doing? His conscience is telling him one thing, but he's putting out something. Ralph got AIDS, and before he died of AIDS, when he was on his deathbed, he told his dad, Dad, I, I, I was wrong. I, I, I wanted what I wanted. I wanted to hear what I wanted to hear, but I was wrong. Do you think God will forgive me? He said, if you repent sincerely from the heart, he will forgive you. And even on his deathbed, he repents. But here's, here's the point. We all find our way to do that. Well, I use an extreme story to make a tragic point. We, we subtly are making that point in our lives all the time where we know something's right. We look at someone else or we try to look to God and go, la, 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 I don't hear you, Holy Spirit. And we have this conviction and we're trying to push out the voice of our conscience. And we need to not do that. We need to listen. Okay, you're talking to me. I don't want to. If my conscience bothers me, the Bible is clear. If you can't do it with faith and a good conscience, it is sin. I don't care if it's allowable for somebody else. Are you following me? What well, isn't allowed for anybody else if it's not allowed for me? Leave that to the judge. Romans 14 wouldn't have been written. I reappeal to that. <laughs> Are you falling out that, that there with the conscience? Will you let God talk to your conscience? The final test, test four, is if you pass this, you decide it's okay for, it, it glorifies God, or it's okay or it doesn't not glorify him. You, you decide that it's not hurting anybody else. Your faith and your conscience allow you. Then this final test is this. Is it the wise thing to do. Is it wise? Not is it right or wrong anymore. We're past that. Not is it wise for someone else. I see that person doing that thing. Is it wise? Don't answer their question. That's between them and the Lord. Answer your question. And what I mean by that is like in the light of your past experiences, your own weaknesses, your own strengths, in the light of your present circumstances, in the light of your future hopes and dreams, in the light of the call of God upon your life, is it wise? 
Is it good? You know, um, polygamy is biblical. I mean, I, I've known guys who've taken the Bible verses about polygamy and used it to build a case saying that while the Bible talks about the two shall become one, each husband and wife is one and one and one and one. Like they're, they're two, you follow me? This is the argument they build. And, you know, my answer to that is, okay, even if you do that and you claim your conscience will allow you to do it, show me any good fruit from that in any biblical marriage that had multiple partners. Zero. Zero had good fruit. So it's allowed. Is it wise? Tattoos. You know, there are certain jobs. I know guys that wanted to get in certain jobs, but because they had tattoos in their hands, they couldn't get those jobs. I'm not saying what they did is evil or not evil. I'm simply saying it prohibited them from something they believed they were called to. In the light of your future goals and dreams and your calling, is it wise? Uh, smoking cigarettes or, or marijuana. If you live in Colorado, you know it's legal, right? So, but, but is it wise? What do the long-term health results show on that? I know lots of people. My own son at one point, uh, Josiah, because Michael would like me to be clear on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> My, yeah, Mike is like, not me, Dad. Uh, <laughs> my son Josiah at one point, he would debate with me, send me all these articles. I'd send my counter -arg -arg articles. Somewhere in the journey, he began to see the, the people that are appealing for it not to be done have no dog in the fight. We're trying to help the people that are, that are getting in bondage to something. If it's legal, it's still the question you've got to ask yourself, is it wise? Which also most smoking cigarettes. Like, I can't find a Bible verse that says, thou shalt not smoke. I can find a lot of things about the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you destroy the temple, God will destroy you. Consideration for your debatable thing. Um, but, but I can't find a Bible verse that clearly says that. But still, in the light of your desire to have future health and long-term health, is it wise? How does dying with COPD feel to you? Not good. So and is it wise financially? Is it wise for health? Does it draw me closer or further from God? And if you resist this, this last piece, is it wise? You don't even have your own best, best interest in mind. The whole thing about wisdom, Proverbs says in, in, in Proverbs chapter uh, 1, at the second half of the chapter, it talks about wisdom calling out, is it wise? And if you reject my counsel, the Bible says, I will mock at your calamity. Talking about if you reject wisdom's counsel. In other words, God's not mocking your calamity. The circumstance does because you weren't, didn't make a wise choice. Are you following me? Would you stand to your feet? I know I've said a lot. Your brains are thinking. Let me tell you what's not debatable. What's not debatable is God's love for you. Arguably the most famous verse in the scriptures is John 3.16. And I think it's famous for a good reason. It sums up God's heart for humanity. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that if anyone believes in him, he'll not perish but have everlasting life. Let's talk about the perishing. I made mention of it. The perishing is where you have where you no longer have a relationship with God and you spend eternity apart from Him in a lake of fire. That's real. I know people, it's not popular to teach today. I decided I'm, I come, I've, when we planted this church, I decided to come out swinging against cultural norms. I get disturbed. There is, no, there is no hell. Well, then there is no heaven. I believe in heaven. I just don't believe in hell. That's convenient. You don't have to fear hell if you surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this, if there is no hell, why did Jesus even have to come die for our sins? We would just all die and go to heaven, right? Are you following the error of that? It'd be one thing if it was just the world that believed that, but there are Christians who claim to believe that. And I'm like, uh, I don't think you can do that. Since Jesus openly talked about it himself and you claim to follow him, he wasn't confused about this place that was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for you, but it will be given to those who want to follow the devil and his ways. And the devil, by the devil, I mean the influence of, of the powers of darkness on the spirit of the age that provokes us towards self-centered living, living for ourselves, and not living with the reality that we were created by a creator for a purpose, and that was to glorify and honor him with our lives, to know him. So that's the 
God so loved the world that he gave his son that you wouldn't perish. He gave his son. Giving it, if you weren't perishing, giving his son would be pointless. But we are perishing apart from God, without God, without Jesus. And so he said, that you can't, our conscience bears witness that we need help. I'm fine. I have people, I meet people. They'll be like, I'm a pretty good person compared to what? Compared to a holy God who's never made a mistake? Compared to what? Compared to the other guy down the road? I had a guy come up to me after ministry one time. He said, Jimmy Nyman, you're so on fire and I'm, I'm lukewarm. And I said, how do you know I'm not lukewarm and you're just cold? <laughs> he looked at me like, you're not supposed to say that to me. <laughs> well, I said, my point is, is if you calibrate, if you're comparing to me, I may be more seemingly more than you, but what if I am drastically less than Jesus? We aren't supposed to calibrate our lives against other people. We compare it to the, to the one God, the living God, God in the flesh, who died for us and rose again, who paid the price for our sins. He's the only standard. I know people who go to church their whole lives thinking going to church is what makes you a Christian. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says those who make a covenant with Jesus Christ through faith and what he did on the cross, his death, his resurrection, believing that he is in fact the son of God. If you're the son of someone, you are heir to the throne. Therefore, he is God of the flesh. Believing that's who he is. If you have the faith to believe that, something supernatural is already working in your heart. And, and, and so that is the way, that is how we come into the family of God. The Bible says at that moment, your sins are forgiven and wiped out. God adopts you by the Holy Spirit. You become part of the family of God. Now, I've raised five kids, and I'm working on grandchildren right now. we got four of those. And, and in the process of that, I, one thing I've learned about all children, though they are my children and my grandchildren, they all make mistakes, but they're still my family. When you say yes to Jesus, it does not mean you won't sin, make mistakes again. It means that you are, you are committed to following your new father who adopted you through Jesus and following your elder brother, Jesus, as Lord in the details of your life. You will make mistakes. The question is, when you sin, the Bible says the righteous man falls seven times, but when he's confronted by God and dealt with, he gets back up and keeps going. This is what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And some of you need to do that today. Why? Because what's not debatable is his love for you. But what is debatable is whether or not we will follow him wholeheartedly. I would love to see that debate end this morning. Some of you need to say yes. And just say, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord. I want to surrender to his leadership. I want to follow him. Could I ask you to do me a favor? Would you just bow your head and close your eyes? Because I don't want people moved by seeing what other people are doing or manipulated by it. I just want them to make, I want this to be between your conscience and God, in a moment, I'm going to give you a moment to raise your hand and say, yes, I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm not going to call you up here. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to do anything. I just wanted you to acknowledge before heaven that you're taking a step. Jesus died openly for you. I'm just asking you to openly raise your hand and say, I want to follow him. And I don't want you to do that. If you want to follow him, I want you to raise your hand. You do it right now. Go ahead. Raise your hand. Go ahead. All over the room. Put your hands down. Christians who are here today, there are probably some debatable things in your life that you've allowed to be in your life that you haven't really checked in. It could be the things you watch on TV and you're maybe a Netflix binge watching or whatever your favorite streaming service of choice is. It could be, it could be things you allow in your life uh, through the internet or things that you've allowed in conversation or, 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 or lifestyle choices. If Jesus is Lord of your life, could you just take a moment right now and say, Lord, Bring up within me anything that stands between you and me that's not pleasing you. I, I want my conscience to be tender to your voice again. Anywhere I put my fingers in my ears and, and tried to tune you out, would you bring it to mind? Now, just let it bring it up to your mind. Whatever comes to mind. As we pray right here, as I lead people to Christ in prayer, I'm asking you to, to, to recommit to your followership of Jesus and getting anything out of your life that's not pleasing to him. Would, you, would all of you join me in prayer if, you, if you're comfortable praying and say, God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want to please you with my life. And I need your grace to do that. So would you fill me with the Holy Spirit and empower me to live a godly life? Convict me of sin in any arena of my life where I'm out of alignment with you. 
Help me to live in the light of eternity. I want to be well-pleasing to you on the day I stand before you. Anything that's in my life that's keeping me from pleasing you, as a follower of Jesus now, I ask you to show it to me and empower me to rid myself of that which doesn't please you. And also help me to add a time in the scriptures in prayer to help me grow. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God thanks for this. Say yes to Jesus. Listen, you probably saw in our, our promotional that, that we have a baptism coming up next month. You know, the first step of obedience to Jesus Christ is being baptized in water. Uh, the apostles went about, in fact, the only way, they didn't raise hands back then. They literally, that's the only way they knew is if you step forward to baptism, you were legit. If you legitimately meant what you said today, I want to encourage you to sign up for baptism, whether here or if you're coming from another church, uh, sign up for baptism for next month. We want to, to have you join us. We'll teach you what it's about. You don't have to wonder about that. But if you said yes to Jesus today, that's your next step. And I want to encourage you, you can do that out in the lobby today at our Welcome Center. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer today, uh, would you? there's a Connect card in front of you that in the back the seat back. If you would note that on your Connect card and put it in our connection kiosk, we would love to know that, first of all. If you are a first-time guest here, even if you prayed that prayer today, I would love for you to take your Connect cards, all of you. If you're a guest, give us your contact info. Take it out to our Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. We'll give you there. What will follow is a, a letter from us telling you if you're interested in taking a next step with Lifeway Church, what are the possibilities and what you can get involved in and how to do that. If you're not interested, that will be the only letter you'll receive. You will not receive another one after that, and you can move on your happy way and go about your life until we see each other again before Jesus. So uh, you can do that. If you have kids in kids ministry, if you would get them by going out the uh, back door here, uh, it'll keep the traffic flow nice. And if you want prayer for anything, we have a ministry team that's going to be up here willing to pray for you about whatever your needs are, whatever you're facing. It can be financial stuff. It could be a job change. It could be, I don't know what I need prayer for, but I know I need prayer. They're gracious and they're, they're confidential and they will love to uh, minister to you. And you can come up at the end of the service after I release this benediction, which I will do now. May the Lord bless you, keep you, strengthen you, make his face shine on you. May he teach you his ways as you walk in a, in a world that's filled with a lot of gray. May he sort the black and the white that makes it up. May you live in honor before him in all the debatable things that come your way. And may he give you living understanding of his word and his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.